So in late February, we started on a, a leg of going to the UK. So we were doing England, Ireland, and Scotland. And the third weekend, we were in Glasgow. And this is early March, March 12th, 13th. We opened in Glasgow. We had a nice, very nice show. I didn't feel quite myself at the end of the show. And we knew the virus existed, but nobody was wearing a mask. Nobody felt much of a threat from it, although it was looming. And at the end of that first show, I felt a little bit like I had was coming down with a flu, which is unusual for me because I almost never get the flu. And I had a cough and our physical medicine team checked my temperature and it was about 100. So apparently they, I had checked off enough boxes that they already had a protocol in the UK. And so they sent me back to my hotel room and told me I needed to stay inside my hotel room for a week. You can imagine how not happy I was about that. Disinformation is spreading. There will be a surprise we outbreak. We only have so many The issue of pandemic. No social at all. They said that they would express their concerns about the mask. Um, Where's the mask? Where's the glove? One expert says a second Get away from all of these people. We all people. need some good news. A message for all the healthcare workers out there. Thank you. If you're looking for hope tonight, friends. Steve Bach is an American keyboardist, accordionist, composer, and musical director. He has had a long and illustrious career as a jazz pianist and has performed and worked with many of the well-known musical artists from a wide variety of genres. And at the age of 23, he played with Stanley Clark's band in two incarnations, the second of which recorded the highly successful album Rocks, Pebbles, and Sand. He toured with Clark and his band for a year, traveling the U.S., Japan, and Europe at the Montreux Jazz Festival. He then went on to play with Kutaro, Ayerto, and Flora Purim, Sergio Mendez, and as Andy Williams musical director at Williams Theater in Branson, Missouri. Steve has recorded seven albums of contemporary jazz and toured with his own band. He is also the founder of Eight Keys Records, a self-release record label. His most current release being Yes and No, featuring Robbie Krieger and Peter Erskine. Steve is the musical director of one of the most successful Cirque du Soleil shows, Crystal, which will resume touring in 2021. After three tries and many technical glitches, Steve Bach, a very warm welcome to 19 Stories. Cheryl, that was perhaps the best introduction of me that I've ever heard in my entire <laughs> life. Thank you so much. Very, very happy to be here. Thank you, Steve. How are you doing today? Uh, you know, this day just keeps getting better. That's all I can tell you. Doing really, doing fine. Thank you. As long as we're breathing and on the right side of the grass, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Okay. So tell me what part of the country you live in. Okay. Well, as you know, I've been on the road pretty much for the last three years, pretty constantly. But my home is in Springfield, Missouri, which is not very far from Branson, Missouri, which, as you mentioned, uh, is where I worked with Andy Williams. While I was here playing with Andy, I uh, kind of fell in love with the Ozarks. And so I decided to make this my base, even though I've been out on the road a lot. This is, this is where I come home to. And I know a ton of musicians here, and it's, it's just really a nice place to be, especially in a pandemic. Well, it sounds like that you are separated from most of the, the mayhem as, you know, versus being in a major metropolis. And before I move on to ask you about Cirque du Soleil and your involvement with that, how did you become involved with Andy Williams? Because in reading, you know, in the introduction, reading your involvement with um, more of the contemporary jazz artists, and then you stick in the name Andy Williams, it's it's almost like one of these things doesn't belong here. Um, <laughs> but almost. It, so how did that happen for you? Good question. It goes way back when I was living in Los Angeles, back where you and I actually used to know each other back in the day. Back in the day. Yes. I received a call and I can't, it's many, many years ago. It was when synthesizers first started to become mm, popular, more popular in pop music. And I received a call from Andy Williams' manager. I had been recommended by somebody. They wanted, Andy was touring at that time, and he was doing pretty big rooms. He was playing in rather big theaters and traveling with a full orchestra. 
and I think it was starting to become too expensive. So they wanted to know if I could replace the string section. You can't make this stuff up. And I had a synthesizer at that time, a Kurzweil, that had an excellent string sound. And so the first time I worked with Andy, I was they basically handed me the music for all the strings. So a transcription of the string parts, which were pretty complicated at that point. It was really good stuff. Nelson Riddle, some really uh, very talented, famous arrangers back then. And uh, I ended up touring with, with Andy, with his band, with a brass section, one violin player, and me. Talk about first violin, first and only violin player. Yeah, it was, yeah, actually it was... Um, Oh, can I remember? Her name was Christine Flowers. Oh, she'll probably get a get a kick out of if she hears this interview. And we toured, you know, I worked that way with Andy for a couple of years. So that was my introduction to Andy. And at a certain point, he told me that he was thinking of building a theater in Branson. So at first he was just, he was a client, a very, a very good client because we, we toured quite a bit during those days, but mostly I was just living in LA and I'd go out with Andy, you know, for a week or two at a time. Later, later when we went to Branson, I became his music director and played piano, but it was a long association, probably over a period of 20 or 30 years that I worked with Andy and I, I miss him. You know, he, he passed away several years ago. Well, and how interesting that he brought you to a part of the country that you, you know, given that you were living in Los Angeles and heavily involved with the musicians there, that you would find another community of musicians that you can be with outside of what that opportunity presented itself to be. So what was the journey from working with Andy Williams to being involved with Cirque du Soleil? Oh, that was a long journey. That... We got time. We got time. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. That's, I'm not sure it is a journey. I'm not sure that even connects. So Andy, Andy in Branson was in the nineties after I left Andy's theater. I did a couple of other things in, in Branson, nothing spectacular, but I did play with some of the old, some of the old pop stars that uh, maybe some of your listeners would remember. Bobby Vinton. Oh, Bobby Vinton. Uh, Jim Stafford, who was kind of a comedian guitar player. Uh, I worked at the Welk Theater. They were doing kind of a, a revision of the Lawrence Welk show, all kinds of fun stuff. And eventually ended up moving back to Los Angeles around 2000. So I left Branson, moved back to LA. And I don't know if you even mentioned him, but that's when I was touring with uh, Robbie Krieger, the guitarist of The Doors. Yes, I did. And um, I was going to ask you about that later on. But since you brought that up, um, did you... And I'm sure you made the connection while you were with him, but that you both released your first album with a subsidiary of Mobile Fidelity Sound Lab on Cafe Records, his self-titled album. Then, of course, how you and I first met when you released your album the same year in 1985 on Cafe Records. That's right. That's right. I didn't think of that when I when I, I actually auditioned for Robbie before I moved back to L.A. I was in Springfield. Oh, it's a funny story because I got a call from an old friend of mine saying that he heard Robbie was auditioning keyboard players. And so I flew from Springfield, where I am now, to, to go to audition for him. And he liked my playing and said, well, do you live in L.A.? And I didn't live in L.A. And I don't even know if I was planning on living in L.A., but I said, I'm in the process of moving to L.A. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted that gig, you know? Right. So... So this was this was in '99 actually, and so by 2000 I actually did move to LA, and and that's that was my first gig in LA was was with Robbie, and we never really talked about about uh, Cafe Records and Mobile Fidelity, but that's right, we were on the same label for a while, and and Robbie and I have uh, you know over the years became really good friends. He was in fact he gave me my first set of golf clubs, and uh, we played golf together many times, and I, I always we we talk every now and then. He's just a, a really a wonderful guy. So, okay, now I'm in LA. That Now I'm going to get back on the story you asked about. I'm in Los Angeles. I'm working with Robbie. And I get another call from another friend who says, do you know what Cirque du Soleil is? Because this is early. This is 2003. I said, of course I know what Cirque du Soleil is. He said, well, they're auditioning, interviewing and auditioning musical directors. Would you be interested in going and, and taking an audition? Of course, these days, well, these days it's is a whole different deal. But years later, it was almost impossible to get an audition with Cirque du Soleil. Mm -hmm. 
back then they were looking for people to audition. They, you know, they were in Los Angeles down at SIR in Hollywood. And I, uh, I said to my, my partner of the t at that time, I said, I'm going to go down and meet with some people from Cirque du Soleil. And the first words out of her mouth was, I'm not moving to Las Vegas. <laughs> I, I said, darling, it's just an, it's an audition. You never know where these things can lead to. You never you know. You just never know. So anyway, she grudgingly, you know, har harumphed and uh, I was on my way down to LA and went to this audition. I don't, I think I remember one of the people actually who was there and it was a very funny audition because what they did was that first of all, they videoed it. I'm sure there's a video of it somewhere, which is be very embarrassing. They would just put on a track or something, you know, some music and then just say, play to this. <laughs> I said, what? You know, just play to it. Okay. So I would jam along with the music and then they put on something else and say, do a string part. Okay. <laughs> I'll do a string part. Uh, but anyway, this, this type of thing is really, this is kind of in my wheelhouse. You know, I'm a, I'm a jazz guy. I'm an improviser. So this, I found this to be very easy. And I think they were, I think they were impressed. Well, obviously you, you got the job, but I'm curious, was it like a, the old music minus one where they play a track where it doesn't have the keyboards or it doesn't have strings or there? Yeah, it didn't. It doesn't, it, yeah. The, the, the one that they said, play a string sound with. Didn't there have no strings. Strings. And there was one that they okay. said play a bass part and it didn't have a bass. And there was one where the guy literally came over and showed me something and said, now play that. And I did. And he said, oh, no, lay it back a little. And I did. He said, okay, good. So it was a half hour of that kind of thing and talking. And so we really hit it off. And so that, that was 2003. And I actually did start getting phone calls from them with offers. You know, hey, can you go to New York? Uh, there's a show there. We need you to play accordion. I'd never even played accordion for them, but they were like, they just thought I could do it, whatever it was. That wasn't on your resume or they had no idea that you played it. They just assumed because you could play all these other parts that you would be able to play accordion. I wrote down that I played accordion, but I never okay. played accordion for them. So I found it interesting that they actually, okay. they must have been desperate. Like, just call Steve. He probably plays accordion. <laughs> Let's bring him to New York. But it was like. It's not a common request, It's not a common right? request. Yeah. And, and, you know, it was funny because I would say, oh, well, when does it start? Well, can you be here in a week? Well, no, I'm a little busy right now. You know, I, <laughs> I do have a life. I, I'm a working I musician. I do have a life. So this went on for a few years. And I eventually made my way back to Branson. Just, I, it's a long story, but I made my way back to Branson as, and shortly after I got back, there was another phone call from someone else at Cirque and that was the beginning of, that That it ended up being a job that I did take and that was in 2006 and I basically have been with Cirque ever since. So it's been over a period of 13 or 14 years. Which is a beautiful amount of time to be with anybody. That is quite remarkable. And you actually did end up in Vegas for a while, though. And I did end up living in Vegas for six years or four and years. I, uh, I'm sure. You, uh, I'm sure your partner loved that. Yeah, it was. It ended up being okay. <laughs> well, I, I mean, and what um, what an organization to be involved in. So. Bring it up to um, at the start of the year. You were on tour when you got called back to the United States because the tour is actually on hold until next year. So what was going on? Where were you at the time? I'm only going to ask you two questions. Where were you at the time? <laughs> Where were you at the time? And how did you transition back to the United States? Okay. Well, good question. So somewhere in February, actually the beginning of the year, I was in Eastern Europe having a just a, an amazing time in Minsk, of all places. But that's that's another story. In late February, we went... Uh, oh, by the way, the show that I'm with now, I think you might have mentioned it, is called Crystal. And Crystal is a show on ice. It was Cirque du Soleil's first ice show and fantastic show. Yeah. In fact, I have been trying to get you, um, in my other incarnation of a podcast, I've been trying to get you as a guest since I saw you over a year ago in Sacramento with Crystal. Yes, you did. That was mm -hmm. a good time. So in late February, we started on a, a leg of going to the UK. So we were doing England, Ireland, and Scotland. And the third week in, we were in Glasgow. And this is early March, March 12th, 13th. We opened in Glasgow. We had a nice, very nice show. I didn't feel quite myself at the end of the show. And we knew the virus existed, but nobody was wearing a mask. Nobody felt much of a threat from it, although it was looming and at the end of that first show, I felt 
a little bit like I had was coming down with a flu, and which is unusual for me because I almost never get the flu. I always get my flu shots. And I had a cough and our physical medicine team checked my temperature and it was about 100. So apparently they, I had checked off enough boxes that they already had a protocol in the UK. And so they sent me back to my hotel room and told me I needed to stay inside my hotel room for a week. You can imagine how not happy I was about that. Well, that's an abrupt change. And did, were you diagnosed with COVID? Did you have the test? There was no way to get a test at that time in Scotland. Although one of the skaters on tour had come back from Japan, and they were so concerned about her that they literally spent, what they told me is they had to spend about 12 to 14 hours on the phone to arrange for a test. So a test, the tests were not easy to come by in March, early March in Scotland. And she tested negative, by the way. Wonderful. So they were not going to test me. They just said, go to your room for a week. That's all. <laughs> and think about what you've done, young man. <laughs> and think about what you've done. Well, little did I know that while I was in my room, dreaming about getting back on stage, that was a Thursday. That was my first day in isolation. On Friday, they canceled the whole tour. So Cirque, that very week, basically closed down 43 shows. Amazing. Every show they had on the road, every show. I mean, they, they were staggered after that. They didn't close every single one down that day, but within the next two, two weeks, they were all closed. But we were allowed to finish our last week in Glasgow. So the rest of the cast was able to perform on Friday and Saturday and Sunday and do their last shows together as a group in a feeling of solidarity and heavy emotion. I, on the other hand, was trapped in my hotel room. And this was, to this day... <laughs> one of the really most miserable times of my life. I can imagine. Because I was away from my fo my friends. I couldn't see anybody. I could talk to people. But they were all, of course, madly, you can imagine the, the company management, managers and tour management madly trying to make reservations and flights and pack things and get the trucks loaded. And I mean, it was, in fact, my accordion is, it's in a truck in Glasgow somewhere, probably. I mean, I haven't seen it. On Monday, so Thursday, I went into isolation. On Monday, everybody flew home, except me. So I was alone in Scotland. I was alone in Scotland in a hotel room. <laughs> oh, Steve. I, it, you know, it, when you said 43 yeah. shows, to think of only, I mean, what one production takes with all the planning and hotels and travel and trucks and yes. loading and load out to grasp what 43 shows stopping and what that means for tickets, <laughs> oh. et cetera. It's, it, it's kind of like one of those moments where you, it takes your breath away and, and yet your show is canceled. Everyone's left. How long did you have to stay quarantined in the room? It was four more days. So, and I, to be honest with you every day, I mean, of course I took it seriously, but every day I went out for an hour just to walk around. I tried to be good I mean, it was, we did, we knew so little then, you know, this is March. I didn't fly. I flew home on March 19th. We, we knew much less than we do now, but I did know to stay away from people. Nobody was wearing masks, but I did get out just to get out and walk around. I couldn't stand it. And, you know, there was nobody there to really supervise me, uh, but I tried to be good. And uh, I had a couple of good friends, actually a good, very close friend that I made in Russia of all places that I was able to speak with and just try to keep my spirits up. But it was... Ah, it was really a tough time for me. Well, did you become very ill? Did you feel that you had that you were exposed to it and that you had it? Well, it I went back and forth with it because I I was pretty miserable for a couple of days, and as it turned out, the cough that I had gotten really lingered almost for another month to six weeks after that. I still was like, man, this cough is just not even after I was back in the states, you know. Uh, but happy ending about about a month ago. So now this is March. I came home, April, May, sometime in June. I had told my doctor about my situation. And in June here in Missouri in Springfield, they started offering the, the antibody tests. So I, I asked him for, a, you know, to write, a, write up an order and I went and had the antibody tests. And of course, I'm positive for the antibodies. Oh, okay. So yes, so I, you did. so yes, I, yes, I did have the, the virus. And you are, um, you're one of the very fortunate ones. I mean, the cough, I understand, can be hellacious. And it's so interesting that some people really are responsive as far as, you know, taking down time and getting rest and mm. 
coming out all right, and there's other people within a matter of days they succumb to the the virus. So there, there's no rhyme or reason. I mean, I know there's more research about blood types, like blood type O, if you have that. And I don't know if you even know what type of blood type. I do. I'm O. Oh, well, o. that yeah. might explain it because they, they say those with blood type O actually recover and rebound much faster and with much less uh, side effects than if you had a different type of blood type. If You know, you never know. I mean, I, of course, I, you know me, I, I take good care of myself. I try to stay in shape and eat well, live well, but I do consider myself lucky. And, you know, I feel like I've got some immunity, some protection. A friend of mine I talked to the other day said, man, it's like you got a green card. I said, well. In a way, that's a funny, yeah. That's a funny thing to say, but I do. I feel, I feel like I have some protection. And, you know, the latest news is that people who test positive don't, don't get the virus again. Um, I mean, that's... No, is that... A, when did you hear that? Because my understanding was you could still um, get it again once you've Well, there's it. conflicting theories, but what, I, what I've read recently is that the people who test positive again probably have not actually gotten over the first time fully, and mm -hmm. that's why the virus is I still see. showing up. So I'm going to go with that and say, at the very least, I've got some uh, a little bit of a superpower, and I'm very careful. Even, even so, I wear a mask when I'm out. I'm careful about social distancing. You know, I do everything as if I... Weren't exposed to you it. Know, yeah. yeah, just just to be careful and just to protect everybody else. But I do feel a small sense of, you know, maybe you could call it relief that I actually had the virus because I was I was pretty convinced that I did. And so my do and my doctors felt the same way. He thought, yeah, you've had it. You've got some immunity here. Well, I so, would feel that protection that was, too. I mean, you have the the correct blood type. You've yeah. come through it the way that you have, and I'm very grateful for that. Because when I read that you were coming back to the states, I, you know, I figured that it was because everything being canceled. But I also wondered for a while. I was reaching out to you and couldn't get a hold of you, and I'm like, are you there? Are you okay? So, um, <laughs> so you're here, yeah. and. Yes, and thank you for that. Thank you for that. You're very welcome. And so I want to know, and I have to tell you, I feel really silly. I finally discovered your album that you did, I just, your most recent release on your label. With, oh, yes, yes and no, you're talking about. Yes and no. Yeah, I was, and thank you. I was about to get to the title, <laughs> but you beat me to the punch. <laughs> Sorry. Um, that, no, that's okay. I mean, that's, it's, I couldn't wait. It's about you. <laughs> and we want to hear from you. But when I listened to it and, First of all, the album cover, the lineup, having Peter, master drummer, oh, Peter yeah. Erskine on the record, and um, Robbie Krieger, it has the look and feel of classic ECM, and it's such a beautiful oh. record, Steve. It, it really, and for those who aren't familiar with Steve's music outside of um, who he's toured with and um, Cirque du Soleil, please go on. Um, and no, this is not a paid endorsement. Oh, I'll pay. This but... is a great show. I'll keep going. <laughs> so tell us about uh, Eight Keys, how that came to be. And, you know, and then I know a lot of musicians are self-producing and releasing now, but um, how, especially this release, how did you come upon the look and feel and compositions? Because like I said, I listened to it and it takes me back mm. 30 years to, you know, being in the uh, radio studio and listening to really good classic ECM releases. Well, thank you for recognizing that, Cheryl, for your comments. That's that's uh, That makes me feel really good because you you and I really never talked much about this. I mean, we haven't really talked very much in the last 20, 20 years, but I am a huge fan of ECM. I never knew that. And uh, particularly, of course, the early days of Keith Jarrett and Jan Jan Gabarak, my favorite, and truly of one course, of my favorite. I don't favorites. know. I, I I don't I don't I don't know how to pronounce these names. Peter knew all the names. Peter was able to tell me. Jan, I say Jan Christensen, but he's like, no, it's Johan. I don't know. He, <laughs> I don't know the names. Yeah. Ralph Towner, John Abercrombie, all mm -hmm. these guys, my heroes, uh, recorded on ECM, and those records mean a lot to me. Even Crystal Silence with Gary Burton and Chick Corea. I mean, there's so many great records, and they continue to make great records. And I decided, well, this I'll go back to 2016. I was in Vegas, and I bought uh, my dream piano. I have a Bosendorfer. Yes. Uh, I showed that to Mark, Mark, who's my husband, and yes. he said... 
Cirque du Soleil has done very well for Steve. <laughs> and, and of so, course, the rest of your career. So Yes. Well, I, you know what? I, I don't want to burst your bubble, but I bought that Bosendorfer on Craigslist. But that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> I those got are it. two. Those are two things you don't think you'd put together, but I got it cheap anyway. No, I still it's a it's a great piano, and I decided in 2016 I was actually working at a at a Cirque show in Vegas, a show called Zarkana, and I decided that I would record. Basically, I would record the album I wanted to record rather than record an album that I thought could make me money, or I thought I needed to record, or I thought I should co- record. I just decided to make an album that I wanted to make for. No other reason. As you said, Cirque du Soleil was providing me with a great living. I didn't need to make money from it. So I decided I should think of a name for a record label. I came up with eight keys, mainly because two keys, three keys, four keys, five keys, six keys, seven keys, and nine keys were all taken. (laughs) So... So uh, I was able to get. So you just kept playing the numbers, and you finally. Well, came up you know what? Eight keys worked. in a scale. Of course. So it worked out, you know. But and I actually bought the domain name. I actually paid money. It's the only time I've ever paid money for a domain. And I got a a great drummer. This is we're going before yes and no. We're going before that. I got a great drummer and a great bass player from Vegas, local guys. In fact, the drummer uh, Jacuba Griffin and the bass player Steve Flora both still in Vegas, both incredible musicians. Steve teaches at UNLV and Jacuba is one of the most sought after drummers in in Vegas. And I did a basically an improvised album with the two of them in my house. So Jacuba was up in the bedroom. <laughs> uh, Steve, bless his heart, with his acoustic bass was in the laundry room. <laughs> <laughs> and I was I was at the piano and we recorded this album without being able to see each other. And it that album was called Eight Keys. And I think you would enjoy listening to that too. I ended up taking it into the studio to finish up on it. And so that was the beginning of kind of my ECM-ish recordings, because before that I was more of a smooth jazz artist. Um, and I, I still love that kind of music too. So I have to get back to, to yes and no. So I'm a huge ECM fan. That picture on the front is a picture I took of our sunset here in Springfield. And uh, I was desperately trying to figure out who I could use on the record that I wanted to use all ECM guys on the record. You know, I wanted to find Yad Gabarek. I wanted to find these guys, Manu... Manu Kache. Manu Kache, exactly. You know, I was, I, I was looking for ECM guys and, and really I decided to do a trio record. And so I came upon, you know, Peter and I, we've communicated in the past. We, we were not, we don't really know each other, but we know of each other. Well, everybody knows of him, but he had heard of me through one of his drum students or something. And I basically reached out to him. And while I was on tour between Phoenix and San Diego, this was with Crystal, I saw that I might be able to get to a recording studio in Los Angeles. So I kind of had this plot to record Peter. And I asked Peter for a recommendation of a bass player, and he recommended uh, Derek Oles, who's a fantastic bass player, uh, toured with Brad Mildo, toured with Brad. So Peter, I had Peter and Derek uh, set up. And um, it just so happens that Robbie Krieger owns a very, very nice recording studio in Glendale, California. And I called Robbie and asked if I could record in his studio. And he happens to have a pretty nice piano there. He's got a, a Yamaha C7. So basically in between, while I was on tour with my two days off a week, during a couple of my days off, I managed to get into the studio, um, record the trio with Peter and Derek. Uh, Robbie was there. He heard the stuff. I actually did a, a remake of Light My Fire. I don't know if you heard that. I actually purchased your album yesterday. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. And I listened to the whole thing while I was um, just kind of reviewing what you and I were going to chat about today. So, Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I I did hear that. It's it's a really interesting lineup of uh, compositions that you have, the Beyonce track. Yeah, thanks. Anyway, so go ahead. So I was kind of thinking, you know, I played the song for Robbie, who's in the studio, and exactly what I had hoped happened. He was like, oh, you want me to play on this? I was like, Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> please so uh and, and if you listen to the solo i i purposely set out to to pay tribute to the the original in fact you'll hear robbie i asked him to start out 
his guitar solo on that, like he had started it out on his original mega hit. And he, he said, I've heard a lot of arrangements of Light My Fire and yours is really good because everybody either tries to copy it or does something so stupid that I hate it. So I was- <laughs> What a compliment. How uh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. So he liked it. And uh, I was really just trying to create a, a, a record that felt like an ECM record. And, and you know, I, at least what you're saying indicates that I was pretty successful. So- Thank you. Really, I had no idea. I mean, this is, you know, it's not like we chatted about it and said, let's make this a talking point. No. I really had no idea that's what, you know, a label that you have revered all these years as I have. So, yeah, no, I looked at the album cover and instantly the way um, you had the credits and uh, the cover art. Mm. And certainly from the really within the first few notes, I was almost... I got really emotional, oh, actually. It is a beautiful record. So now, obviously, ECM inspires you. What other music inspires you? What are you listening to these days? Yeah, I, I mean, I do listen to a lot of ECM, but it's, it's, it's a good question, again, because one of the things I decided to do when I slowly, slowly, because when I first got here, back here, I wasn't sure how long would we be here? What's happening with the virus? Are we really, is the tour really canceled? But as it became more and more clear that I was going to be spending quite a bit of time here in Springfield and time alone, <laughs> that I was thinking what I could do, what, what would be the great, what would be a great thing to do while I was here? And, and the thing I came up with, Cheryl, is that I've all, often over the years, and you hear a lot of musicians say this, I wish I had time to practice again. I wish I really had time to, to work on my craft. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I've always wanted to do is to dig back into very heavily into bebop, traditional jazz, uh, because that's an area that I always felt like, um, you know, being being an ECM guy, being a, a fan of Chick Corea, being a fan of Keith Jarrett, I kind of, I don't want to say I skipped a step, but I, I never really sat down and dug, you know, I mean, everybody knows the music of Charlie Parker, but I never really made an intensive study of, of some of the old masters. And there's a guy in New York a great bebop pianist who studied with one of the legends. This legend, his name is uh, Lenny Tristano. And I decided that I would take some bebop lessons. So once a week, I call my teacher, David Frank in New York, and I study bebop with him. And it's been so rewarding. So I'm listening to a lot of Bill Evans, and I listen to Keith Jarrett's uh, The Standard Stuff, uh, the traditional... Oscar Peterson. So I'm listening to a lot of standard classic jazz. That's part of your answer. That's that's one of the things I listen to. But I've also become a very big fan of of lo-fi, chill, hip hop. <laughs> I, I like so many kinds of things, but I really like this whole lo-fi revolution that's taking place, you know, scratchy sounds and old recordings of little jazz phrases that are looped. Uh, so some of it's just, you know, just general listening. And as far as artists, I mean, there's a ton of artists that I like to listen to. So Well, it sounds like you've been adjusting to the shelter in place by really digging into the meat and potatoes of, I mean, if you're studying bebop, that's mm -hmm. a lifelong study for most. I mean, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, it's, it's heavy duty. And maybe that's why you skipped over it for a while, because it does require focused effort and attention, which I'm sure you're realizing that. Oh, for sure. For sure. It's it's really a joy to me. And of course, now for the first time in my life, I mean, since I've had this piano, I think I've had it about six years. It's, you know, to be able to sit down and practice on a gorgeous sounding, lovely instrument is, is of course, is like a dream for me. So I don't practice like I used to. I used to practice sometimes 12 hours a day. You know, a couple of hours is plenty. But uh, it's really, really time well spent, and I'm I'm really enjoying it. Well, and that's the beautiful thing about this time is for for some, and of course, it goes without saying if you're not meeting um, the rent and keeping a roof over your head and concerned about kids and all the other myriad of concerns that people have. It's one thing, but if you do have the time to be focused and take on projects, and and that's what I'm finding is kind of this period of grace where people are having a chance to reevaluate what's important and also spend time doing things, whether it's cleaning out your garage or learning bebop. And I certainly don't equate the two. 
Although it depends on what your garage looks like. <laughs> no, well, in a way, it's it's pretty similar. You know, just it's just getting it's just it, you know what it's an opportunity to get around to some of the things you haven't yes. had time for, yeah. or that you've you've managed to cr- procrastinate, and this is one of them for me for sure. Well, do so. you have any specific fears regarding this time, and if so, what are they? Well, I have to say uh, that it can be a bit lonely here. Right now, I, I have my daughter for two weeks, and then she's gone for two weeks. That's the arrangement I have right now in my life. And I have the company. My, my daughter's 15. Great. An amazing person. So it, I do have someone here some of the time. But then when she's not here and when I'm by myself, I, I do struggle with loneliness sometimes. So it passes. And we're not really locked down here in, in Missouri. So I make it a point every day to get out and go somewhere where there are people. And I have some friends here. I, I of course, still have friends here. Um, most of them are practicing social distance. A lot of them are older. So I, you know, I'm not out gallivanting and visiting friends all the time, but I have some good friends here that I can see. I have some concerns about the state of our world and the disease and how things are going to look at the other end. These are more general fears. But in general, I, I'm pretty upbeat, Cheryl. I feel... You always have been, Steve. And and, oh, and yet, you. you know, this time brings up things that maybe we've never felt. And being alone can certainly, whether they're good times or not, yeah. that can get to you. And having your music as an outlet and being with your daughter. And why don't you speak for a moment to how is uh, Branson, Missouri right now? What is the shelter-in-place directive, if in fact there is one? Well... I'm in Springfield, which is about 45 minutes from Branson. Oh, Springfield. Yes. Sorry. Uh, But Branson is very central to this area. Branson is where all the the shows are. This is a part of my life and professional career that I'm hoping to, you know, maybe I would sub on a gig or do do a couple of days somewhere. But this is this is a part of my life where I don't expect to return and be working in Branson full time ever again. But Branson, apparently most of the shows there, they have a lot of shows there. They have like 100 theaters in that town. And apparently many of the shows have reopened uh, just with smaller crowds and they're, you know, properly social distance. So things here are are open. Restaurants are open. Um, Stores are open. A lot of them have a rule. You can't come in unless you're wearing a mask. I find that uh, Missouri being, well, we could call it a purple state. It's a little more red than blue, though. I find here that sometimes people have a bit of an attitude about wearing masks and they don't wear them and when maybe they should, and that's that's a bit distressing. But in general, I think people here are, are doing a good job. They're, they're social distancing, uh, but things are open and cases are rising in Missouri. So it's we have the same logistical problems that all the big states do. I think mm-hmm. one thing that gives us a little advantage is that we're, we're more spread out here. So, you know, there are, there are no big gatherings. In fact, my daughter's uh, marching band was canceled officially. For school, she's going to go back to, she will actually go to school two days a week. They've divided the school up into smaller parts. So she'll be there two days a week. The rest of the time will be virtual. And what does she play when in the marching band? Uh, she plays piccolo. She's, a, she's a, an excellent flute player. Uh, but she's one of the few people in her school that has a piccolo. So she's, you know, the, the default piccolo player in, in her marching band. I love it. Do you ever play together? We do. Once in a while, I'll get out, you know, she'll, she'll be playing a, oh, I don't know, a book of solos and I'll, I'll fake the other part of it. You know, <laughs> we do. Uh, not a lot, not as much as I'd like. Um, but she's a, she's an excellent, excellent musician and plays really well. Well, look at her father. She hasn't fallen far from the tree and who knows, maybe <laughs> in her future, she'll be called by um, Cirque to come play a piccolo part. Somewhere along the line, you and you, never uh, know. you on accordion and her on piccolo. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't encourage her to, to follow a career in music. I whatever she wants to do, of course. But I think she's probably going to be a you know head for the something in STEM. You know, science, technology, math, something. This well, is, that's certainly needed now. It is it's so interesting when you talk to successful artists, um, musicians, or actors, et cetera, and they say, uh, certainly my kids can do what they want, but I, I don't recommend this career. And, and I understand that. You know, We see the glitter and hear the wonderful success stories, but certainly the road to getting there is challenging. It's a tough one. It is. It is. It's a struggle you should only take on if, you're, if you can't imagine yourself doing anything else. That's, that's how I put it. If this is if this is your passion and this is what you must do in life, then you know I'll support you a hundred percent. 
But if, if you like something else better, if you have just as much drive to be a doctor or a software engineer or an IT person, by all means, make that choice. And, and you'll always have music. She wants to play in a you know local orchestra. She, of course, she wants all that too. So you can have both. You can, and it's got to be your why. I mean, if you if your why isn't strong enough when you wake up and you say, I, I just have to play, I just have to act, I just have to, mm. you know, uh, whatever it is that your passion is, um, it won't be strong enough to drive you on during the tough times. So um, how did you connect with Empire of the Sun? <laughs> because I understand that you, you co-wrote a song that has over not only 100 million Spotify plays, yes. but it was also, wasn't it uh, top 100 songs of 2013 on Rolling Stones chart? It was. Isn't that amazing? That's crazy. As, as, as the, I hear all the time, that's crazy sauce. So <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy. That's crazy. So how did that happen? Yeah, it's not as, it's not as far fetched as you might think, although it's incredibly far fetched. When I was finishing up my first Cirque show, which is probably a story for another time, which was in Macau. <laughs> the first Cirque show in Asia, I was a part of that. I was looking to move back to the States and to get on a show in the U.S. And there were two shows that I was very much hoping one of them I could get on. One was a show in Los Angeles, which was called Iris. And one was a show that was going to be at Radio City Music Hall in New York. That was where it was opening, which was called Zarkana. And I was very fortunate that they liked me enough to offer me the job at Radio City with Zarkana, which later moved to Vegas. And the composer of that show, Cirque had tried to get Elton John to write the music to that show. And Elton, I don't think, was interested. And, I, and some of this is just my uh, opinion. I think Elton said, I've got a protege. And, and, and Steve Bach is it. No, no, it had nothing to do with me. This is the composer. <laughs> Steve Bach is <laughs> it. And it's, his name is Steve Bach. No, no, they asked him to write the music. And, and he said, I have a protege. This is what I think happened. This is this is just in Steve's world. I know he did recommend that they hire this guy, Nick Littlemore. I know Elton did recommend him. And I think part of what he said was, if you do that, I'll write a song or two for the show. Because he did end up writing a song that was included in Zarkana. It didn't stay in Zarkana, but he wrote a song for Zarkana. So Nick Littlemore was the composer of Zarkana. Nick Littlemore was an Australian, basically mega talented producer, rock star, synthesizer, nerd, this really amazing youngster, not that young, but he was young then. And he was the composer of Zarkana. And the first thing I thought about when I heard that he was the composer of Zarkana was, oh, this could be a great intro for my son, <laughs> who's, a, who's, a, who's a singer songwriter. I didn't think anything about myself. And Nick and I became friends. And while Nick and I were while Nick was working on the music to Zarkana, this little group that he had put together called Empire of the Sun started blowing up. It wasn't, it hadn't blown up yet, but while he was writing the music to Zarkana, this music of his, this group called Empire of the Sun started taking off. And um, because Nick, when you're, when you're the composer of a Cirque show, you're basically, I don't want to say you're trapped, but it's a very intense, very long experience. So Nick and I spent a lot of time together. And Nick is a very creative guy. And one day when we were in Montreal, Nick said to me, hey, I've got a studio downtown uh, with a real nice piano. Come down and let's, let's throw some stuff together. It was that kind of thing. So Nick and I became collaborators. We probably between us have created 300 ideas, 300 mini versions of songs. And one of these songs was improvised with Nick, who's the, who is half of Empire of the Sun. The other half is the lead singer, Luke Steele. They call him Emperor Steel. Thus and Empire so, of the Sun. That is Empire of the Sun. Okay. So Nick rented an apartment while he was recording, while he was writing Zarkana, he rented an apartment in Greenwich Village. And one day, Nick and me and Luke Steele were in Nick's apartment in the village, just jamming. And one of those jams turned out to be this song that Nick and Luke really liked. <laughs> And Nick said to me, I think we're going to put this on the album because they were working on an album. And I said, no, you're not. You're just such a liar. He said, not only am I going to put it on the album, but it's going to be the single. And I said, no, you're not. You're lying. <laughs> <laughs> 
that's crap. That's Stop great. it. And, uh, you know, if you listen to the song, I ended up doing, you know, 10 hours of synthesizer overdubs and playing all his vintage keyboards. And, and, and we actually did another song. We wrote another song that also ended up on the album, but it wasn't a single. So this one is called Alive, Empire of the Sun. And, uh, you know, it's just really my, my good fortune. And, you know, 100 million plays on Spotify later, you know, it's, 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 it helped with the Bosendorfer too. Let me put it that way. <laughs> I, I was going to suggest that. Now, and you were nominated for the Australian Performing Rights Association Award as well. Did you? Yes, did basically it win? the Australian Grammy. Uh, no, it did not win. Okay, but to be nominated is quite an honor. Ooh. This is not something I would, I did not expect to get that nom a nomination for Dance Song of the Year from anybody for any reason. <laughs> well, I, I wouldn't necessarily put your name in that category. Um, <laughs> but Steve, I mean, you know, it's always interesting to look from the outside and say, what a charmed career, but it really does sound like you've been in the right place in the right time for some really wonderful things to happen in your career. And one of the things I wanted to, uh, it's just complete sidebar, has nothing to do with anything other than you mentioned Radio City Music Hall. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember the year, uh, I'm sure you do, when you played with Kataro mm -hmm. at uh, Radio City Music Hall, but I came to see you. Oh, wow. And anybody knows what parking is like <laughs> in New York City <laughs> on a Friday. <laughs> and at the time I was dating a man uh, who lived in New York and he drove a limo. And so we drove a limo into the city and found, I mean, literally like your show was about to start and my parking prowess, I just have that luck. Someone pulled out, we pulled in, we checked the 5 million signs that say, you know, you can park here, don't park here as long as your left foot is facing east, you right. know, how New York wow. is. But that's my parking success oh my. story. <laughs> that's amazing. I'm just remembering now that you came to that show because it's like I f totally forgot. Yeah, and I actually forgot I'm... until I was, you know, making some notes and I went... Oh, well, except that that always sticks out in my mind when say, oh, you're never going to find parking in New York City. Or you're never going to find parking here. I go, let me tell you about the time that I was in New York and going to see Katara, Steve Bach playing with Katara. And, wow. Um, wow. and I remember I was riding the elevator to come see you after the show and Roberta Flack was in the elevator and oh my God. <laughs> some other people that I just kind of sat there and drooled and didn't say anything because we're going to I've always liked you. Hi. <laughs> remember when you did that song? Well, yeah, I recorded it. Thank you very much. <laughs> my with my feet. Feet. Um, wow. so and then tell me about the courts collective because <laughs> this is the other thing you don't know is i have your composition puzzle as my um alarm my morning alarm really oh that's so nice yeah so every morning i'm like i mean you know, depending on the morning it's like <laughs> oh steve bucker oh shut up or... the, the courts collective <laughs> oh that's that's a bit of a, I don't want to call it a failed experiment, but that was. <laughs> oh no! Why? Well, that 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 band was the three musicians of Crystal. You know that, or maybe you don't. Oh, know when that. you the, right when you the, the trio that comes out ahead of time. Right. Got except it. Okay. except the clarinet player left the show, so kind of broke the band up. <laughs> <laughs> Leave it to the clarinet player. It's either Leave the it, well, accor you know the accordion that. player, the piccolo, or the clarinet. Yeah, actually, that was that was a, a little flight of fancy for me. I decided that since I was on the road all the time with these two brilliant musicians, which is uh, Stepan Gritsai and Camilo Mota, um, that we should record something. So I actually recorded the parts for that song, Paz Sol, in my hotel room. And... Uh, really came out very nice. We did another song too. We did Libertango. And I was going to try to do something with it, but it just kind of, you know, life gets in the way. So it's it's not dead, but it's, let's say it's on hiatus for right now. <laughs> but I'm really glad you mentioned it. It's Things do come full circle, you know? Um, and and yeah. with the kind yeah. of, you know, just hearing your stories and how things have come full circle or have had a resurgence when you thought, oh, well, we... A perfect example is when you were um, talking about Empire of the Sun. I mean, you thought it was this little project you were doing, and then it was released as a single, then it has the success that it has. Yeah, you never know. I mean, it's, it is true, Cheryl. I think that 
if you put yourself out there, if you practice, if you if you cherish your art, that inevitably good things will happen. I mean, I'm I've heard your one of your other interviewees say, you know, it's a it's a blessing, and I do feel very blessed by it. But oftentimes, hard work will you know will lead to something. Yeah, I certainly know that there's parts of the country where studying music is still very. Um, much thriving. And, you know, Mark and I lived in Nashville for a couple of years. And I think, you know, they just come out of the womb playing. It's just, yeah, right. <laughs> they, they just do. Sure. And, um, and yet there's other parts of the country where, you know, you think by just being able to play a scale, all of a sudden you should have a recording contract. <laughs> so but that's a, that's a whole other story. I, I digress. <laughs> so it sounds like during this time, you found a way to keep your mind and body and act. I mean, you're definitely healthy. I'm so glad to hear that. Thank and, you. you know, I would imagine touring with these amazing athletes because that's what anyone who is a performer with Cirque du Soleil, they are amazing athletes. They are. And um, you go backstage and you have craft service, but they're all eating, you know, fruit and staying away from carbs and working out. <laughs> and it's probably all the guests that are, you know, loading up on the on the carbs. But um, is there anything that you do when you become overwhelmed that, you know, isn't your music or isn't working out? I mean, do you have a meditation practice? Do you... Um, mm. I know you were into martial arts for a while. Yeah, I was. I was. And I I don't I don't really do that anymore. I, I, I just can't do what I used to do in that way. But I I think it's for me it's always been physical, physic staying physically fit. Even today, every day, like I say, I go somewhere, even if it's if it's to walk around the mall and I, I go out every night and walk the streets, run the streets here. This is this is for me. This is what keeps me in balance. Is is exercising, getting your heart rate going, feeling alive. I have a a very small gym downstairs in my basement with some dumbbells and a bench and a chin up bar and pull up bar. And uh, this has always been my salvation, really. That and of course reaching out to friends. Uh, I'm not a big. I'm not. I used to be more into meditation. It's it's not something I do right now because it's. Again, it's so solitary, and I'm already so solitary that I prefer to do things, even going out and seeing the people walking and wave to people and mm -hmm. see kids riding on their scooters. Life, life yeah. in all its glory. Yeah. So this is what I do. I try to keep myself. And of course, I do get great comfort and solace from, from music and from my piano. And, you know, it's taken a lot of years that I can sit down and play the piano and actually enjoy listening to myself play. <laughs> it takes a long time to get to that point. But I can say that most of the time I actually don't mind what I'm playing very much. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? I think no matter what um, artistic field you're in, that artists tend to not want to either listen or look or review what they're doing because, you know, hey, it's I guess maybe it's the process of creation um, that you're always creating and not settling for what you've done. I don't know, but I have a, I have a good little little quote for you. This is my my jazz teacher, David, David Frank. Uh, because one day, one night when I was playing for him, and usually when I play for him, he's, you know, he, he's always recognized that, that, you know, I'm, this is not some beginner studying with him. He understands that I, I have a talent. Uh, but one night I was particularly lamenting how, how bad I sounded to myself. And he said, well, you know, Keith Jarrett has this quote in one of his interviews. And what Keith said is when he used to practice, he would say to himself, there must be a reason this sounds like shit. <laughs> and if Keith Jarrett would say that to himself, then all of us, you know, are on a journey to improve, you know. And that's not a quote that you would associate with Keith Jarrett because he's not so prolific not and confident when he's playing. So uh, the best the best piano player in the world, in my opinion. Um, what makes you hopeful? My daughter hmm. and music. Certainly not the news. And my friends. And, you know, there is such that balance of being informed and not being overwhelmed by it. So it is important to hold on to what makes you hopeful. And is there something else you would like to talk about as it relates to this time in your life or in moving forward before we come to a close? You know, Cheryl, I think my computer may actually crash pretty soon. It's I just noticed it's getting very low. <laughs> and I, I know we have to do something okay. so that this uploads properly. No, no, no. I'm fine on my end. You don't have to worry you, about anything. It's all okay because <laughs> I, I don't want to. I don't want to like lose all this information that we have here. It's kind of like the camera's pulling in close. They're going for the kiss, and it's like, 
up, cut, <laughs> lighting, <laughs> fly in makeup. I, I'm really concerned that we get like that this doesn't it won't. get a No, erased. no, no. It's all on my end. So don't <laughs> okay. don't you worry about it. All right. All right. Well, I, pr- I probably have time to say something deep and meaningful here. <laughs> because everything else has been fluff. Because everything else has been bullshit. So here we go. <clears throat> um, You're the first person. Well, I think I've had someone else curse a little bit. I just said shit. That's all I said. Yeah. And you added the bowl. Somehow it makes it stronger. <laughs> um, what did I want to say? So would you like me to rephrase? Do you want me to ask you the question? Steve, take two. Is there something else you'd like to talk about as it relates to this time in your life? Nothing comes to mind, Cheryl, but I do want to say that I wish you all the luck in the world with your podcast. And I think it's a great thing you're doing, going out and, and getting mm. different opinions and finding out what people think. And, Thank you. And most of all, perhaps giving some people who are out there and isolated or in quarantine or going through a rough time, help to give them a sense that they're not alone, that other people share their frustrations, their pain. Maybe they're, maybe they're, maybe some of them are finding some joy in their solitude. I certainly hope so. I've certainly be able to find from time to time to find some joy. And uh, it's a good time to connect virtually with your friends. That's for sure. Get on your Zoom or your Skype or your WhatsApp and Mm -hmm. call a friend, say hi to somebody, reach out, let somebody know you love them and just enjoy the blessing of life while we can. Amen, Steve. And that was so beautifully said. And and thank you for saying what you did. And um, that is the purpose of this. It's really to serve as an audio journal of this time. And I appreciate you encouraging people to do you know, to reach out and connect with people, because if there was ever a time that it's needed, so desperately needed, um, is right now. And I appreciate your time. Um, It's, you know, hopefully it won't be another year, year and a half before we can connect again. Hopefully. But if not, I appreciate the lifelong bond. And there's so much more we can talk about. So who knows, maybe we'll revisit and um, do another chapter when you're when you've re-entered life but I do appreciate this time so very much and how can people get a hold of you if they want to whether it's via email or uh, if you're on Instagram or any of the social media sites what is the best way to get a hold of Steve Bach mm, good question um, Steve Bach music on Instagram and Steve Bach on Facebook and uh... There is a website. It's functional. That's where you found the album. And that would be stevebach.com. Those are the best ways. Uh, you reach out to me, please feel free. I'll respond if I, if I see it. Thank you. And buy his record. <laughs> yes and no. You know it. what? You can download one of them. One or two of them are even free on my website and, and you're welcome to it. I'm not. Steve. Okay. Let's back up into the promotion time. <laughs> all right. Buy these records. <laughs> Buy well, you know what? Records. Spotify is a great way. Get on Spotify, Apple Music. I'm 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 on all those all those platforms. Um, you know, have a listen. Drop me a note. Um, it's nice to know that people are out there listening. Mm. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Cheryl. You're welcome. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. I hope you've enjoyed this episode today of 19 Stories. Thank you once again to Steve Bach for being my guest today. Join me next week when my guest will be voice actor, bass baritone singer and VO coach, George Washington III. I'd also like to thank the following news outlets for the use of their clips in so aptly painting the picture of the fear that we're facing during this pandemic. BBC, PBS, Now This, UNESCO, and Some Good News. I especially want to thank Joel and Luke Smallbone, otherwise known as the group for King and Country, for allowing me to use an excerpt of their song, Together, which could not be a more hopeful and inspiring song for such a time as this. Finally, I'll leave you with the following from Proverbs 23, 18. Surely there is a future and your hope will not be cut off. Thank you again for joining me today. Feel free to offer feedback or a story idea at 19stories at soundsatchelstudios.com. Visit my website at soundsatchelstudios.com via Instagram at Cheryl Holling VO. I look forward to sharing more stories on the next episode of 19 Stories from Fear to Hope. Until then, stay healthy and hopeful. Together we are dangerous, together with our differences, together we are bolder, braver, stronger.